On this episode of Chat with the Conductor, we have the unique privilege of being joined by four exceptional horn players, all members of our own horn section, Jake Wadsworth, Jonathan Shaw, Tyler Smith, and Cal Hughes. They are all gearing up to perform Robert Schumann's Concertstück for Four Horns and Orchestra with the Alpharetta Symphony on November 3rd, 8 p.m. at Alpharetta First United Methodist Church. For tickets and more information, please go to alpharettasymphony.org. Written in 1849, the Concertstück is an exhilarating showcase for both the horn, quartet, and the orchestra. Schumann was a composer deeply rooted in the romantic ideals of emotional expressiveness, the glorification of nature, and the human condition. It's worth noting that he wrote this piece during a remarkably productive period known as his chamber music year, a time when he also composed several other significant works. While the piece had its critics initially mainly due to its unusual requirements for four horn soloists, it has become a staple of horn literature and an audience favorite worldwide. Schumann's choice to write for four horns was not entirely whimsical. Horns have long been associated with the German romantic ethos. Ironic, though, that while we often refer to the instrument as the French horn, the reality is the Germans did invent the instrument, though it's likely the French mastered the instrument first, thus the naming convention. So we skip all that today and just call it horn. At any rate, the horn conjures images of the forest, of hunting, and of the pastoral, all themes that resonated deeply with romantic ideals. Schumann himself had been exposed to the capabilities of the newly designed valve horn, and he was eager to exploit its expanded range and tonal possibilities in this piece. Not to mention, this piece would likely not have been playable without this invention. The Concertstück is, of course, a tour de force that calls for intricate ensemble work and exceptional solo passages. It is divided into three movements, played without pause, each demanding a different character and approach from the musicians. The piece begins with a lebhaft, lively movement that immediately grabs the audience's attention, and I mean immediate. It then transitions into a lyrical romanza, revealing the horn's ability to sing, though revealing is kind of a weak way of putting it, as everyone knows the horn can sing. And finally, it concludes with a rousing sehr lebhaft that allows for moments of technical virtuosity. What really sets this piece apart is its dynamic interaction among the four horns. They are not merely echoes of each other, but unique voices that converse, argue, and harmonize all at the same time. Schumann ingeniously intertwines their parts, making it essential for the players to operate both as individual artists and a cohesive unit. The Concertstück presents a sonic landscape where the horn's heroic, lyrical, and virtuosic qualities are all given a platform. The work has delighted audiences globally, transcending cultural and linguistic barriers. Interestingly, Schumann was known for assigning poetic meaning to his compositions, never explicitly disclosed any literary or programmatic associations for this piece. Perhaps he left it as an open canvas, allowing performers and audiences to paint their own stories onto its rich musical fabric. Schumann once famously said, to send light into the darkness of men's hearts, such is the duty of the artist. That's pretty dark itself, but the, the concert shook indeed sheds light on the emotional and technical range of the horn and the artists who dare to interpret it. And if anecdotal accounts are to be believed, Clara Schumann, a virtuoso pianist and Robert's wife, was profoundly moved upon hearing the piece and even considered it a technical marvel for its time. So as we look forward to hearing our talented guests perform their masterworks, let's delve into a discussion about the unique challenges and joys of bringing Schumann's vision to life. So let's start with Jake, Mr. Jake Wadsworth. Uh, so the Concertstück features a rich tapestry of thematic material that interweaves between ensemble and solo passages. Schumann's romantic voice is evident throughout the piece. Is there a particular section where you feel the horn's voice especially resonates with Schumann's emotive composition. So absolutely, I think there are um, many instances of romantic writing in this, this piece, and I think especially his writing between the horns and how melodies carry through. Once the main melodic theme repeats towards the end of the first movement, I think there's a lot of play between the horn parts, especially the high counter melody that he adds throughout the end of that first movement 
feels very large and it's absolutely an example of something that couldn't have happened on a previous horn where I don't think that could have happened on an after horn. And, and it's hard to get on the, on the, on these horns too. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say this piece is easy, but um, it's at least possible on these horns. Many of these melodies are very intense and beautiful and long lines that are filled out by the intersection. Mr. Jonathan Shaw, it, it's interesting to consider that the horn Schumann would have known, like we're talking about, was different from the modern French horn. Technological advancements have resolutionized the instrument since the Romantic period. In the context of this, how do you balance the historical integrity of the music with the capabilities of a modern instrument? Nowadays, we have the double horn, which they didn't have yet uh, back back then. It was it actually wasn't invented, I think, in, for another like 40 years or so. It certainly makes it easier for us to play a little bit, marginally easier. But uh, I think it still kind of preserves that. I think it helps us uh, expand upon what Schumann's vision was, kind of preserves how maybe he would want it, make it sound even better, I think. It's, it's interesting, like you're, you're pointing out that like Schumann writes this piece barely after the valve horn is invented. And yet there are still not many pieces that are much harder than this piece. So how is it that Schumann was already writing the one of the most difficult pieces for a horn that hadn't really been invented or hadn't been able to to like produce that that level of complexity yet i, I don't know he uh, seemed to have uh, a good vision for the future i think and uh from what i understand he had good inspiration from schubert uh and he had i think schubert had the uh like a violin quartet that did something similar that the horns do in this piece um so I think maybe he drew inspiration from that. I remember ring, he sketched this out in like three months or something like that. So maybe he just got really excited and decided to just throw it all out. <laughs> he just threw it all in there. No, yeah. no holding back. Right. I'm only going to get one chance, which is kind of true. I mean, who would write for four of one instrument to be the solo and right. think that they're going to be able to do that again? So you might right. as well put it all in at once. Yeah. Right. It's like a special occasion. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Mm. Tyler Smith, uh, th this piece is, is well regarded for its emotional breadth. Uh, Schumann being a composer who's deeply in tune with his own feelings and the romantic ethos infused this piece with a variety of um, emotional nuances. Is there a specific moment in the piece that uh, resonates with you on an emotional level? And how do you go about conveying that through your part? Yeah, probably the most emotional part of this piece for me is the Romanza, especially at the beginning. Every time I listen to it, I get chills. Uh, it's just a simple melody echoed between the first and the second horn. It, it calls back to the origins of the French horn. And I just... <laughs> It's it's beautiful. It's so simple, but so beautiful. I mean, I guess that's all you mean sometimes is the most simple thing in order to oh, yeah. get, get the point across. Absolutely. Uh, Cal Hughes, I mean, Schumann's influence from literature and poetic forms was, was profound in general, and his ability to translate textual sentiment into musical expression was extraordinary. If you're imagining that your particular horn part is a character in a story, what kind of narrative or persona would you associate with it? Playing the fourth part on this piece, I would say it's it's much more of a like I'm, I'm supporting cast almost. Like first and second have a lot of their you know moments to shine. They have all these different very soloistic lines, and I think you know third has a good amount of those as well. But my part, while it has that still in there here and there, I'm very much like there to make kind of make everybody else sound better. Um, they're putting a lot of um, just support underneath on a lot of just different chords, different lines and stuff, just helping uh, fill out the sound more and really support everything else to my left and really try to help uh, just make everybody else sound really good and just make it a much more cohesive sound throughout the entire section. While all of that is no doubt true, you're being extremely modest and saying you're just <laughs> backing everybody up. There's there's nothing in the foreign part. I could play the foreign, fourth horn part, right? No. Absolutely. <laughs> you gotta do it. Definitely <laughs> not. 
there's definitely some big licks in the fourth horn part for sure. Oh, oh, absolutely. There's a there's a couple spots that I looked at. I was like, oh man, <laughs> they <laughs> took a lot of work to <laughs> out some of those spots for sure. But no, I mean it's it's a lot of fun to get there to play with everybody and really try to fill out that sound. And, and to that point, I mean, each of your parts in the Contra Stuck have their idiosyncrasies, their complexities, their moments of brilliance. In the spirit of Schumann's layered compositional style, could each of you highlight a passage that you find particularly challenging and discuss how you navigate it as a quartet? Uh, specifically, a part that I think about is uh, like the very tail end of the, of the third movement, um, very tail end of the whole thing. We all come in like stacked on these uh, this triplet thing that's been going throughout um, towards the end. It's a da 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 sort of thing. Really getting that lined up, synced up, and everybody coming in just right at the same moment. I think has been a little trickier than maybe we thought to begin with. Just getting those synced up and hitting all the the correct notes because the horn is pretty finicky in that respect but it happens throughout the whole like it opens with it that's like da, 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 dum, dum, dum. that's triplets open it for us so that's one of the trickier spots it's no surprise that it's it's the same issue for the orchestra the orchestra has it not nearly as difficult as the horns do but it's the same thing over and over again it's that eighth rest jumping mm-hmm. into a set of triplets over and over and over again and then of course if you are not fourth or I don't know. I guess if you're not the first one, if you're not the first one starting that that cascade, either going up or coming down, then then you uh, it's going to be much more obvious whether you counted right, whether you breathed right, whether you you heard it right. I mean, that's got to be that's got to be rough, right? And, right. Yeah. And every single moment, you've got to be on it. You've got to be so aware of what your spot is at that particular second. Yeah, for something so seemingly simple, it can be an enormous responsibility to to get in sync with everybody. So, so even more to that, I mean, in, in this in this kind of ensemble piece, I, mean, I talked about this being Schumann's uh, chamber music year of chamber music. I mean, this is obviously a chamber music piece with some orchestra stuff in the background. Um, it, it, this very often, as it does in a lot of chamber music, acts like a conversation between distinct voices. The four of you have individual identities as horn players as well. So how do you balance your individual artistic voices with the need for cohesiveness in the ensemble setting, especially in a piece as intricate and emotive as concert should? I think this piece is just like playing something with the section like you. All like as you approach this piece, it's absolutely like you're doing section playing back in um, back behind the orchestra. It's very similar to Mahler writing, where you know the horn is very present and it is very important, but also every part of that is important. So as like I think when we all are working on this, it's very important that we do the same things and make it sound good in the orchestra, blend and approach the same style. And you know when it is you know Tyler's Heiner sign or Jonathan's or mine or Cal's. We always make sure to listen to them in four style because it is their moment. It is their solo. It is their line. And that's the most important part. It's all about teamwork for sure. Um, I know in this, in the second movement, uh, Jake and I go back and forth um, with our, with those intertwining lines. Um, and it's important to really find the same color and tonality and everything. Um so that doesn't sound like two different people necessarily, you know, like just trying to make that cohesive unit. Right. Right. Which is much harder than, than it makes it sound like two people, two different people playing the same set of notes is never going to sound the same unless you're really, really trying to sound the same. And then it's one of the most difficult things to do. Right. Not to mention you all play different, different manufacturers of horns right yeah different mouthpieces yeah different countries make different horns and different metals even we all have different bodies we all have different bodies and you know yeah right and individually we all have very different individual sounds i think but we're coming together very well yeah want to 
Right. <laughs> right. Well, it's a, it's a thing that most, a lot of people don't think about as much, but I know, I know from experience that like, especially in brass sections, and also it's, it's very similar in woodwind section, but especially with brass, if, if, um, you know, and in, as things go, generally it's, it's, the tone is set by either literally or figuratively by the principal horn. But if you don't sound anything like the principal horn, then probably you're not going to get into that section. It's not as a mean you're not a good player. It just means that if you can't match the same tone qualities in different, in different situations with that principal, then you're probably better off somewhere else. And that's why, you know, the Chicago sound is extremely significantly unique to itself and most people don't prepare to get into that orchestra that section because that's extremely different than every other orchestra on the planet that doesn't mean that every other orchestra is the same but chicago is just a, that much different that much right. more unique. and some orchestras even go as far as making the full section play on the same model and make horn just to make it that much uh more unified Right. Yeah. So those those sections probably get paid more though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a I, guess. I think the only two, the only two I can think of that still do that are Berlin and then is it Cleveland that's all Con eight D still? Uh I think it's uh yeah, I think it's Cleveland. Cleveland still all Con eight D. They all play on cons, huh? I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Represent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, but, but, it represent ah, ah, but also it is a sound and yeah you, you're totally right the make of the instrument does do a lot for the tone it makes interesting challenges when we work together but as tyler said i think we're really figuring things out and like jonathan yeah. said there's that there is some, some moments in the second movement where me and jonathan you know pass off the same melody or playing it in canon and my only job in that whole t- moment is making sure that i sound exactly like jonathan yeah, and even in the, the the third movement, there are spots where we're doing ascending and descending like arpeggios, where we're trading off different sections of those arpeggios. So we have to same uh, sound like we're the same line or the same instrument going up the line to make it sound like it's one line instead of three different lines from three different people. And then the orchestra has to do that with and without you. Because so, at there is at times I th- I find it fascinating. Like at times, Schumann has parts of the orchestra. Usually it's the woodwinds, and usually it's the flutes or piccolos that are with like first horn. But then sometimes nobody's with anybody. In fact, usually fourth horn gets left alone. But then first <laughs> horn gets doubled with two instruments. Well, I just I, I'm not saying it's like a bad idea, but it, I I'm I'm. I'm not understanding like what Schumann is thinking. Why double the first horn part, but right. not if, you know, did he not have faith in, in the bassoons that they could play along with the fourth horn? Like that, it, that seems unlikely. So why was he making that decision to leave one particular line or instrument, solo instrument alone while, while tripling, you know, one of the, the second or third, uh, you know, solo parts. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. That absolutely comes down to melodic value and timbre. Like absolutely, um, there, there's there's a long history of you know the importance of horn and woodwind instruments, and especially like horn and flute and horn and oboe. So I think there's a specific timbre, and I think there is a lot of value in that. Yeah, and I think it, it there there can be a point in this piece where oh my god, I've listened to horn for twenty minutes. I need something <laughs> new. And it, there is a lot of value, in, you know, at least hearing the flute do something important. But there is, that's true, though. There are very few moments when there's not at least one of you playing. Mm-hmm. Right? It's very, yeah. very sure. It's just the one, the first half of the middle section in the second movement, right? That's it. It's the only moment, like significant moment when you're not playing. The orchestra presents mm-hmm. that second melody and then you join. So you get like, what, yeah. 16 bars or so. That's your one yeah. break. And uh, yeah, we stay pretty busy. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. It's it's it, welcome to being a string player. That's that's what we do every piece, every concert. The one only one other section I can think of in the whole piece that's like where we drop out for a good bit, and it's that part we were just talking about in the third movement, like before we come in and have those ascending and descending arpeggio stuff that passes between 
each other. There's a there's a little bit of it that's all orchestra, and then we have to we take over a little bit. We have to fit into that and do the same thing where it's all supposed to sound like one almost one instrument doing everything instead of everybody passing it off from one to the other. And it, I, I think that's what makes that part one of the most difficult parts of the whole piece. And probably that's the moment everybody remembers. Mm -hmm. Like, like for me, I think that's the moment. I think that's the moment. Like if I pick one thing out of it that like keeps going through my mind, it's just that one moment. And, 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 the, and then like you guys do it, like the, the more in tune you are with, with matching timbres and matching sound and matching volume and then making a line happen, but through the four of you, that like, that makes it even more effective in a way that's, that's, it's unmatchable. It's unmatchable. Well, thanks guys for talking to me. This is going to be an awesome performance. This is, uh, even though this piece is not unwell known, it is still rarely performed because it's hard to find foreign, foreign players crazy enough to do it. So uh, thank you for being crazy enough and good enough to do it. Um, so again, this is going to be November 3rd, Alpharetta Symphony. And we're going to uh, 8 o'clock on November 3rd at Alpharetta First United Methodist Church. Tickets are on sale, but I mean, they're going fast, especially after this podcast um, at alpharettasymphony.org. So we will see all of you there, front and center. Also on this same program, uh, actually our opener is Jennifer Higdon's Blue Cathedral. This piece is, uh, as of this year, 25 years old. And I actually reached out to the composer, Jennifer Higdon, to be on this podcast. And she declined politely, um, very personally. She, she declined uh, just because this is the 25th anniversary and the background of the story is very personal to her. And she said, it's just, I've done so many podcasts and I just can't do any more talking about it. So that was her note for us. So we're going to play this piece as the opening to our concert. It takes a little bit of understanding. Why would we do this piece? Why? How does this fit with everything else that's on the program? And once we started rehearsing it, Mr. Alex Fricker is our second oboe and English horn on this concert. He had a very specific connection to this. So I want to welcome now Mr. Alex Fricker. Thank you for joining us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your musical background and how you came to be with the Alpharetta Symphony? Thanks for having me, Grant. Um, my name is Alex, and I play second oboe and English horn for the Alpharetta Symphony. I started music actually when I was very, very young. I was six years old and started taking piano lessons. I actually learned how to read music before I knew how to read English. So it's been it's been with me for a while. I had a lot of musical experiences, which we'll get into. I ended up studying oboe performance at the University of South Carolina for my bachelor's degree. I went on to study partially my master's in music at uh, Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati. I ended up switching career paths a little bit and eventually moved here to Atlanta and really was kind of missing that music in my life again. I started joining community orchestras and groups and eventually auditioned and made it into the Alpharetta Symphony, which is such an awesome group. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to play English horn and, and oboe with y'all. And that's what's got me here today. We're, we're really lucky to have you. I mean, the, it's no secret that good English horn players are hard to come by because <laughs> a lot of people just kind of avoid the instrument. Uh, so the ones that really embrace it, that's those yeah. are the ones you want to keep. So, um, so we're glad that you're here. I wanted to quote you a little bit. You had shared your your personal experience. Um, so this is what Alex posted for us. He said, "For me personally, this piece is about reconnecting with lost love, celebrating the joy, remembering the pain, and growing with those around you as you continue life." The first orchestra concert I ever attended was hearing the Atlanta Symphony play this piece. My connection is remembering the awkward teenager with chills in the balcony thinking, this is what I want to do. This is why I'm here. For Jennifer, it was finding a way to remember and honor her brother. For you, I imagine it could be something else entirely, but I think everyone can find a way to connect with the piece at a level other than just the singing melodies and ethereal harmonies. I really encourage everyone to listen to recording to get a feel for what this piece is, can be. I thought that was really touching and very open with you. And, and that's a pretty dramatic 
first concert and first experience to say this this piece did it for me. And I would venture to guess that not a lot of other musicians said that that was the first piece that they heard and decided this is what I want to do. But that's what it did it for you. Yeah, it's it was a very special moment for me. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a small town in South Carolina and I always loved music, but my experiences were mostly, you know, going to church and, and hearing music there and my mom staying in the choir. Um, so the whole event for me it was really an event. You know, we we got all dressed up and we drove all the way to Atlanta, big city, right? And uh, went to this concert. Uh, it was just me and my mom. And we sat in the balcony and I just wanted to soak in everything. I, I, I loved everything about it. The people everywhere, <laughs> the hall. Um, I pulled up the program notes and was reading through them because I wanted to know everything about all the pieces that they were going to play. And that's when I read um, the notes about Blue Cathedral, which I don't remember exactly what order it was on the program, but I just read it and, I, and she explained about how she wrote it. And, and you know, it, it was originally for Curtis as an anniversary sort of composition. And she started writing it thinking it should be celebratory, but she had just recently lost her brother. And that just hung, you know, on her while she was writing this. And she she wasn't really able to write something that was a celebration. So she ended up writing this instead. Um, and it was just really moving to read about. And then coupling that with finally hearing a professional orchestra live in person and and the whole experience was just somewhat overwhelming. Um, so it really just it moved me a lot and and it stayed with me all these years. I mean, I remember when when we started the rehearsals, um, I was doing some research trying to kind of reacquaint myself with the piece and couldn't find anything anywhere about the number three. <laughs> And and so I did a little bit of digging and I'd had to do some math and and I I I checked and and sure enough I was remembering from the program notes back when I was a teenager something that they had in there about her brother who passed away when he was 33. And you'll notice, you know, if you come to the concert and hear the piece, that there's a lot of percussion in groups of three at the beginning and at the end. Um and she did that on purpose. It, it it meant something It you know, it, it might not be intended to make you sad, but it did mean something to her. And it kind of gives you a different reaction to the beginning and, and the end of the piece, because if you just heard it, yeah, it's pretty and, and very twinkly and it gives off that sort of glass cathedral vibe. But knowing that little bit extra is um, makes the the piece a little bit different. It hits it a little bit differently. It, they start to stretch out, you know, the further they get and in the piece, and and it just almost seems longing, and and you kind of can pick up on that. Um, and there's a lot of little Easter eggs, I guess, in the piece. Um, would encourage everybody to show up for the pre-concert talk to find out more. Um, read the program notes, of course, um, to. To learn more about the piece and some of these special things that she's kind of hidden in. It's interesting that you you point out that that she started off with one idea, something celebratory, and then it became something else. And I would bet that with many composers, they had the same idea because from from the beginning of of whatever the music business was, all the way back as far as can go, even as far as Bach and and earlier, they're all writing for a purpose. Sometimes the purpose is themselves. More often, it's because somebody asked them to write something for this ensemble or this person or this event. And for this amount of money, this amount of money. I mean, it's all, it's all about you know sure. some kind of purpose. And so everybody that's a composer sits down to write something for a particular purpose. However, that doesn't mean that the most amount of money or the biggest event produced the best result. And instead, very often, it's it's when the composer 
has to write this piece, no matter what the original intent was when they sat down. And so in this sounds like in this case, that's what happened for her. And the thing is, as, as you pointed out, and, you, and everyone will have to experience it on their own, that just because this is the story doesn't mean that you will have that, that same experience. And the, and the way that I receive this piece, not, maybe not even as clearly as you do, but, but I understand the background that she puts into it and what her story is behind it. However, for me, it, it, has, it has everything that, that goes into an epic piece. There's, there's the setup, of course. And of course, like you said, there's a lot of percussion in this piece. So it begins with just percussion. And it's not it's not random, though it may come off that way, but it's it it's not random. It's a collection of sounds that leads very subtly to when the sounds, you know, the the active music sounds come in and then add to that. And then it, it grows over time. And, and before you realize it, now it the level is upped. Now there's more energy. And then it, there is even more energy. And then finally there's this huge huge melody that just gushes and overflows and then finally settles back to where it started. So you'd have this feeling of having gone somewhere. For her, the idea was a journey through losing losing a loved one. For anybody else, they may see that, they may see their own story. But it to me it's 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 fascinating that like that that, that she sat down for one purpose and the overwhelming one showed up. And that's all that really matters. It doesn't matter that that she she had some other idea. It matters that that that's what came out. Absolutely. And and I think that's really important. A lot of really great compositions happen when composers write what they need to write. And you know, this is one of her most performed pieces. <laughs> I think for a very good reason. Right, exactly. So you talked about lost love. H how does reconnecting with lost love manifest for you personally each time you perform this piece, especially within the the setting of an orchestra? Great question. So you kind of touched on the journey that you take with this piece. And, you know, for Jennifer, in, in her case, it was finding a way to come to terms with the situation of losing her brother. Um, I think particularly for the audience, I mean, this, this piece is not necessarily atonal, but it's kind of post tonal almost. And it's really important to keep in mind that concept of going on a journey, I think, um, which is kind of how I feel when I'm trying to play it and trying to make a trying to make a connection to the piece is to not try to focus on where's the melody, what's the chord progression, you know, all of that, that you maybe would with a Beethoven symphony, which we're also playing. <laughs> um, and it's more about just experiencing the sounds and letting it take you where you feel it needs to. So for me, the very first time I listened to this, um, it was a very different experience. I was, you know, full of optimism and excitement and wonder, um, imagining my future and what I wanted my life to be. And now it's a little different. You know, I, I don't do music professionally, but I still play. Um, I'm in a career path that I never really envisioned I would be in. So for me, it's not that I lost a love. But it's that I'm in not where I th thought I would be. Um, it's not what I imagined. So for me, it's it's more of recognizing that and allowing myself to embrace the journey that I've been on and all of the things that I've learned and to be happy with with where I am because I still get to play music with excellent ensembles and play pieces like Blue Cathedral that I, a year ago, never would have thought I'd be able to play. And it's a wonderful experience. And just because it's different doesn't mean it's bad. Um, and that's kind of the connection that I try to hold on to when I'm playing this. Um, you know, life takes you on all kinds of journeys and 
five years from now, you, you may be somewhere where you never expected to be, but you have to find a way to look at it and, and grow from it. And I think that's a really important lesson for um, life. And, and this piece is trying to kind of portray. As a musician, because because even though you're you're on a different career path, you are more than a, a regular musician for sure. How do you how do you take that that uh, profound emotional um, journey, and how do you how do you apply that during a performance? How does that affect you during a performance, or does it? Is it is it there? Is it palpable in that moment, or is it really mostly on reflection? That is a really excellent question. <laughs> I think for me personally, I'm sure it's different for other people, but it, it's it's hard to, to pinpoint. I think part of the beauty of music is that it's a lot of emotion. For me, I try to hold on to that feeling. I mean, I, I do spend some time thinking about it outside of performances where it's a little bit easier to articulate. But while I'm playing, it's a little bit more reactive. I, I try to feed off of sort of the energy that we're getting from the group. And I might have some ideas of where I want to go with a solo. Um, you know, that's the nice thing about English horn is we mostly just play solos. So I can sit and I can listen and I can kind of take in the ambiance and the setting of the orchestra and play off of that. Um, so I might have some ideas on on I want this solo to be very reflective or very melancholy. Um, but maybe the way that it was set up isn't exactly what I was expecting. Um, and so I'll, I'll take that and I'll try to play off of that and still direct it kind of in the way that I'm imagining, um, which is a really actually nice analogy for what we were just talking about you know you, you get something from the orchestra and you, you just kind of have to go with it and maybe it's not what you wanted then you just you still have to play and and make it beautiful and um i mean i'm, I'm making it sound like it's a bad thing it's actually really fun <laughs> i mean that's the that's the essence of 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 what we do in general and of course you you're talking yeah. to a conductor in in the role of a conductor ideally i don't make any noise and so that means that the sounds that come out, I have uh, all I have is to react to the sounds. That's all I have. That's my only mode is to be visual about the sounds that I hear or that I'm trying to help us create. So you're right. It's interesting how probably many people don't understand that the difference between what we do and improvisation, it's very distinct, right? We don't make up the notes as they go along. We don't make up the organization of the rhythms. We don't make up any of that stuff. However, what's on the page is not music. That's the music is only in our minds. The music is only how it manifests um, when it's all put together in that particular way. So now, as far as the notes and the rhythms, those things we don't make up, we interpret, we 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 kind of meld, we 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 push and we pull and we do things with them that that in the end are uh what we perceive as the most appropriate. However, we also have to improvise a little bit with that based on like you said, how the group is kind of melding at that moment. Sometimes not very well at the moment, so we try to affect that in a better way. And sometimes it's much better than we than we had thought of previously. Like, oh, that's that's I didn't think of that. Yeah, that's a good idea. So I'm going to go with that. And so yeah. that's our improvisatory moment. But it's not changing. It's not like jazz in that you're you've got a uh, a blank. You've got a canvas that has a mood, and then on top of that, you're going to build things and you're going to take the notes as they come to you that's it's a very distinct difference but i don't think that everyone realizes how improvisatory it is even though we don't make up the notes we don't we're we're we are taking literal things that are on the page in front of us it's almost like reading a poem right you could have two people read the exact same text and give very very different uh effects you know this piece it, it it seems to kind of embody the essence of moving forward while while keeping 
close the past. Um, how do you think this piece inspires or challenges musicians and, and even audiences to reflect on their own experiences of loss, love, and and even living? That's a another great question, Grant. Lots of hard questions. Plays off of some of the things we've already talked about. You know, for musicians, it's being in the moment, listening to what's happening around you, and paying attention to how it makes you feel. Um, which I would argue is is the same for the audience. They the challenge is to almost remove yourself from time and to just experience what's happening. Um, and I think that is the most important thing in with music in general is is not to be concerned about hearing the right things or you know, what you're going to eat for dinner afterwards or anything like that. It's, it's being in the moment and enjoying what's happening and letting it speak to you without trying to tell it what you want to hear. Um, I, I think is the biggest challenge. That's very well put. I mean, I, I, I agree completely that there is more value for sure in in being at a performance, a live performance of any kind of music and allowing the sounds to take you wherever it's going to take you, but allow them to take you and for that extended period of time. I think this is going to be a great concert. This is a uh, uh, this first piece, of course, is seems miles away from the closing piece. So in the first piece, we have a piece that's 25 years old, and then we have Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. It's not it's not anywhere near each other on the timeline. However, they both have the possibility of taking us somewhere. Everyone should come see Alex and the rest of us play this piece November 3rd at the Alpharetta First United Methodist Church at 8 p.m. Uh, tickets are going really fast. Um, so I would not miss it. Don't miss Alex. He's going to be sitting there right in the middle. If you're up in the balcony, you'd be easier to see him. Um, I'll be able to see him, but you know, yeah. it's my job. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for joining me and we'll see Absolutely. you. We'll see you at the concert. Sounds great. See you there.